Walter, thank you for joining me here for the first episode of the D Community Conversations. It's good to have you. Uh, today, nice to be here. today we're talking about uh, the origins of the D programming language. We did a paper on that, you and I and Andre Alexandrescu, and we published the paper for the History of Programming Languages 4 conference, and you gave an online presentation for it because the conference was canceled. It was during the pandemic and we didn't get to uh, attend in person. And our paper, uh, the introductory chapter started at the first uh, D programming language conference, which was actually in 2007. It was hosted by Amazon. They provided the space for it. It was arranged by, I believe, Brad Roberts. We ended that first section with this paragraph. The D language the conference attendees had come to know was quite different from the D language of today. It was a one-man project, its history inextricably bound with Walter's experience in computer programming, developing compilers, supporting compilers, working on teams, and even participating in aircraft design. It all started with a computer game. So let's start there. You had an interest in computer games before you went to college, correct? Well, it wasn't a computer game. It was uh, it was a board game that started out. Uh -huh. And started out when I was uh, uh, you know, 12 years old and I went to see the movie, The Battle of Britain. And there's a scene in there where the control center they set up to manage their attacks and tactics was a room with an elevated balcony around around a central area where there was a gigantic map of the British Channel and Britain on one side and France on the other. And on that map, there are all these counters. And the counters were their ships, their airplane squadrons, and their, uh, their stuff where they thought the enemy might be. And there was a uh, a bunch of staff running around with these pushers on the end of long poles. And as they get uh, radio information about where things were and what was happening, they would push the counters around the board. And if you know my game Empire, you see it looks kind of remarkably like that. <laughs> and I also enjoyed the game Risk a lot. So there's elements of Risk in there and then the game Risk and there's elements of this... Uh, strategic map that the British used to fight the Battle of Britain. Mm. So I got this uh, four by eight sheet of plywood. I painted a map on it. I drilled a, a bunch of holes on one inch centers and I made all these counters out of uh, cut cardboard and my uh, risk playing pieces and set it all up and created a bunch of rules for it. And I only got one, one of my friends to play it with me and he was very <laughs> nice. He really indulged me. And we played it for a while, and I, you know, I came to the re the sad conclusion that it was unplayable. It was unplayable because there was just too much to keep track of, and so, you know, the whole thing got shelled. I don't think there's even a photograph of it. Mm. And in high school, I took a programming class, and all they did was teach us how to. I wrote a solver for the quadratic equation, you know, print out the roots, and that's as far as I got with programming. Mm. on that. It was done with punch cards. And then we went to Caltech and Caltech gives each student a computer account on the PDP-10. You could do whatever you wanted. So <laughs> I started spending nights playing all the little uh, games they had on the computer, you know, like Star Trek and N-Star and Nuclear Destruction and uh, Lunar Lander and all those things. And I uh, soon became bored with them. I wanted to write my own games. So I typed in this game called Hammurabi from the uh, famous book, 101 Computer Basic Games. And it wasn't long before I started extending it till it was several times the original size. And I was going through my dad's papers the other day, and I actually found a listing of that program. Oh, wow. <laughs> a, a long lost, uh, I thought that was all completely lost. And there it was. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, I realized that uh, I could re resurrect my game and have the computer take care of all the boring stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's how Empire was born. And it was in basic and it rapidly exceeded the uh, K 
capabilities of the basic interpreter. So I learned Fortran. And Fortran was far more capable than basic, but it still ran painfully slowly. So I started getting interested in optimization and making it faster and sort of that way became interested in uh, compilers because <laughs> I'd look at what the compiler could do and um, how it converted um, programs to machine code and was thinking, you know, I could do better than that. This <laughs> isn't even doing the algorithms in the book on how compilers work. Of course I could do better than that. <laughs> so that was the birth of the game and then uh, the birth of my interest in compilers. So you sold the game for a while, didn't you? Um, not, well, I sold it a uh, whole two copies for a PDP 11 version of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my business coup. And then, uh, got an IBM PC and recoded it in C for the IBM PC. And then I shopped it around to various uh, game companies and they all rejected it. And I put some of the rejection letters up on my website, uh, classicempire.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, proud of my failures. And then Interstell got interested in it and turned it into Intercell Empire, which was a huge success mm. in the marketplace. And you uh, got, I guess, emails or letters or whatever from uh, people for several years, right? Um, who played the game? Oh yeah, I still get letters from people who play the game, including mm. some who said they've got divorced because of the game. <laughs> uh, one person said they dropped out of college because of the game. I got a letter from uh, a hate mail from a girlfriend of one of the <laughs> <laughs> one wow. of the poor saps who played the game. <laughs> um, that was before you know become addi becoming addicted to computer games was really a thing. Mm. So. <laughs> Uh, one person threatened to punch me out because of <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> what the game did to his GPA. <laughs> <laughs> so you got into Caltech for a mechanical engineering major. Um, why did you choose that major? Oh, I've always been interested in machinery since I was uh, really small. I would take machines apart to figure out how they work. Had an erector set which was one of the coolest toys ever because you could build machines with the erector set. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I build them and uh, I always loved uh, steam engines and steam engines are cool because the machinery is on the outside. Mm -hmm. You can see it working. You can see all the valves and the cranks and the levers and the tubes and the wheels and the gears. And it's just fascinating to me. Uh, diesel locomotives is all hidden by, by a shell and, I'm not a locomotive enthusiast like other people. Other locomotive uh, enthusiasts are all obsessed with the serial numbers on the cabin and the uh, route, routes and schedules and uh, materials they pulled. And me, I was always interested in the evolution of the machinery. Mm. Uh, I've only found one book ever that detailed the evolution of uh, steam engines. But anyhow, 100 years ago, I definitely would have been a steam engineer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then also with the Battle of Britain and Magnificent and their flying machines, I got interested in airplanes. So, and again, it was less the flying of the airplanes than the machinery that made them fly, you know, figuring how they fly, uh, how all the stuff works in it. So I went to become a mechanical engineer and uh, with, a, with a minor in aerospace engineering at Caltech. Hmm. And your uh, interest in writing a C compiler, did that happen while you were still at Caltech or was that after you left Caltech? Oh, I never heard of C when I was in college. I see. Okay. It was all uh, Fortran and Pascal and I was going to build a Pascal compiler, but, you know, it didn't survive my experience with Pascal is that it was a teaching language, not a practical language. Hmm. And that was uh, Niklaus Wurst's um, early Pascal compiler. It was not very useful. Uh, companies like Borland made it useful by adding a lot of extensions to it. Mm. After my career at Boeing, 
I talked to a colleague of mine said I was going to write a C compiler. And he says, well, I know just the, just the guy you got to see. Uh, he's the local C guru in our area. And let's see what his opinion was. And, you know, I said, great, let's go talk to him. So we got to lunch with him and uh, he looked at me and he says, you know, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> Actually, he didn't say that. He says, who the fuck do you think you are <laughs> thinking you can write a C compiler? And well, I didn't have any answer to that, but I kind of went back to the office kind of boiling a bit and decided I'll show him. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you did. <laughs> it, it, it's funny what motivates people because uh, I always read on the internet about how people are discouraged by an airy word by some teacher or classmate or professional that, you know, who did they think they were thinking they could do some do something they aspired to doing and they got discouraged and went into something else. And me, those things always kind of made me angry. <laughs> I was mm -hmm. going to show them that I could do it. I've often made a career of doing things people told me was stupid or impossible, or I lack the requisite skills to do it. Mm. So you, you did go to Boeing after Caltech. You, you landed at Boeing in 1979 and you were there yes. until, until 1982. Now, this actually uh, had an impact many years later on your uh, design ideas for D. And we wrote about this a little bit in the paper. Uh, wh what are some of the uh, uh, principles you learned at Boeing that you applied to the design of D? Well, one of the interesting things was... Uh how to assemble things in, a, in that the only way to assemble it is the correct way. For example, if you have a piece of machinery that has a four bolt, four bolts to hold it on, the usual approach is to make the four bolts form a symmetrical square. That's all nice and beautiful, and that's the obvious way people design things. But then what happens is the mechanic putting it together has one of four possible rotations to put the device on and mechanics often will install it in the wrong orientation. And Boeing put a stop to that by taking one of the holes and offsetting it somewhat so that it's impossible to install it in anything but the uh, right orientation. I had a car at the time with mechanical fuel injection and the timing on it or yeah, the timing on it was controlled by a spline. And the spline had something like, you know, 40 or 50 teeth on it. And if you did not put the splines into the right socket in the right orientation, you didn't have any indication that it was wrong. It, the engine would just run poorly. And the more teeth off you were, the poorer it would run. So Boeing resolves that problem by putting a key on the spline. So the spline can only be slipped together in one way. Mm -hmm. Another example of that is the hydraulic controls, uh, like the motor that drives the stabilizer trim deck screw up and down, has an input and an output. And if you reverse the input and output connections with the hydraulics, the motor is going to run the opposite way. It's it's commanded and these kinds of things, you know, hooking the controls up backwards has happened many times with airplanes and it always causes a crash and nearly always a fatal crash because the pilot is unable to adapt quickly to the controls working backwards. Mm. So Boeing has gone to great effort to not allow these parts to be assembled incorrectly. So with the two ports, uh, first off, the supply lines are not long enough to reach the wrong port. They can only reach the right port. Uh, next all, they're color-coded. So just with a glance, you can see if they're hooked up to the right ports or not. Uh, the next thing is they use different size pipe fittings so that one pipe fitting will not fit on the other port. And one is a left-hand port or left-hand thread and the other is a right-hand thread. And this puts a pretty good stop to all the mechanics who say, I know it goes the other way. <laughs> <laughs> They'll even build themselves an adapter to hook it up. <laughs> so 
So to even prevent that happening, part of the pre-flight is uh, checking to see the con that the controls all go in the right direction on it. And mm. uh, I think Boeing solved that problem. But it laid a, left an impression on me to always design things that you want them to work so that they fit together the right way automatically. They don't fit together many, many ways, um, all of which are the wrong way but one. The next thing I learned at Boeing is all systems fail. All components fail. So the question is, how do you make something that doesn't fail is the wrong question. The question is, how do you make something survive failure? And Boeing and the FAA have a rule that any single failure should not prevent the airplane from landing safely. And I talked about this to some people. I said, well, what if the wing breaks off? I says, well, believe it or not, there are actually two wing spars in there and they're there for exactly that reason. Uh, they're riveted together. Uh, one of the spars can completely fail and the airplane will still fly safely and land. And so every component, every system in it that is flight critical is redundant and has a backup on it. Mm. So in software, what that factors into is people who have the hubris that they can write software that cannot fail. And you see this hubris in like, I saw a 60 minutes episode where a hacker demonstrated that through the keyless entry system of the car, he could control the brakes and the accelerator. Hmm. Now that is a giant no-no uh, in aircraft design to have two critical systems connected like that where the failure can propagate from one to the next. They would be completely separate computers. It's like when you go on an airplane and you see the infotainment system and screen in front of you on uh, the seat back, that is not electrically connected to the flight control system. There's yeah, no way the to hack into the flight <laughs> control system from the passenger uh, computer system. So things like the avionics systems, the autopilot, there are two autopilots. Each one is made with a different processor, different algorithms, uh, different software and different teams writing it so that there's nothing in common other than they do the same thing. Mm. And their output is run through a comparator. And when the, the, they don't agree, it doesn't guess which one is the right, which one's wrong. It just shuts it off and notifies the pilot that he can't use the autopilot on that flight. Mm. So with software, this also comes down to when you have an assert fail, you can't recover from it. Because when your assert trips, it means your program has entered an unknown state. When it's en entered an unknown state, you can't continue running the program. What you need to do is exit the program, you know, do not pass code, do not collect 200, and notify the system or the operator that the system has failed, and then he engages the backup or does whatever he needs to do. Mm -hmm. You never uh, continue on because you don't know why the program has failed. It's in an undefined you know, literally undefined state, it could do anything. Mm. So I learned that and I've argued with, <laughs> debated with people about this many times, people who are convinced A, they can write software that doesn't fail and B, that it's just a little error, they can continue running their program after uh, a cert fails. Mm. So let's move uh, out of Boeing now. In, in 1982, you left Boeing and that's when you created your first uh, business, the Northwest Software Company, to yes. uh, sell your new Northwest C compiler. Yes. What what prompted and the idea to sell it? Yeah. Sell it? Oh, yeah. that was always the idea was to sell it. Ah, okay. <laughs> was to write a better compiler than the others, and uh, you know get in on all the, all the fun of writing and selling software that was going on in the, in the industry in the early eighties. So mm. yeah, I wanted, I wanted in on it and I wanted to write compilers and sell them. And Northwest C went along for a while. It didn't sell very well because I, you know, don't know anything about marketing. So then uh, Roy Sherrill of Datalight approached me and he was looking for a product and he decided to, and, you know, made a pitch that he could handle all the marketing and the sales and the manuals. And all I had to do was write the compiler and collect the money. So that sounded like a good deal to me. So 
we went into business together hmm. and it was sold as daylight C for a few years. And I finally got my chance to implement all those optimizations I found in the compiler manuals. Hmm. Uh, and this came out as data light optimum C. It was the first data flow analysis compiler on the PC that I'm aware of. All the computer magazines at the time, once a year, they'd have their big uh, C compiler roundup issue. At one time I counted there were something like 20 C compilers available for sale mm. on mm. DOS. And so I eagerly sent them the compiler, uh, figuring it would blow away all the competition. And then we got the uh, article back after it published. And what it said about Data Light C was Data Light C was broken because it deleted all the benchmarks. <laughs> <laughs> and what had happened was benchmarks in those days were not written with data flow analysis in mind. They would do things like A plus B, A minus B, A plus B, A minus B. And the data flow analysis would recognize that this didn't actually do anything. And so it deleted it, mm. which is what a good optimizer does. So this sort of made me furious that they never contacted me and asked me about this. They just printed a, a extremely negative review of the compiler and the uh, our sales flopped mm. for some months. It was a disaster for us. But the other compiler vendors weren't fooled about what happened. <laughs> mm. They noticed that you know we had implemented a data flow analysis uh, optimizer and they knew they had to develop one too to remain competitive. And by the time the benchmarks came around again, all the major players had data flow analysis optimizers in there and, you know, we no longer had the advantage. Mm. Then I was looking for another advantage to have, and I was looking in the bookstore and there's this book called C++. So I picked it up and took it home and well, on Usenet at the time, they were, um, there was a news group for each language, one for C++ and one for Objective-C. And both of those were considered successors to C. And they both had about the same amount of traffic. Well, I picked up that book on C++ and- That would be Bjarne's book, thought, right? C++ plus plus pro, that yes, would that's be- that's Bjarne's yeah. Bjarne book. Yeah. And I read it and I thought, oh, I could do this in a, two or three months, uh, you know, fa basically a hubris spawn from <laughs> complete ignorance about what this would take. But uh, first, I had a concern because uh, I, StepStone was uh, selling Objective-C and they wanted a hefty royalty fee and license fee from anyone who wanted to implement Objective-C. So I managed to get a hold of AT&T's uh, intellectual property lawyer and I called him on the phone and said, you know, can I write a C++ compiler? Can I say it's a C++ compiler? And can I call it a C++ compiler? And he said, sure, go ahead. And I says, well, without any uh, license or royalty. And he says, oh, no, no problem. Feel free, go ahead and do it. And he laughed and he said, you're the only one who's ever even bothered to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so I, he says, you have my blessing to go do this. So. Uh, and about that time, John Haggins in England had a company and he was reselling some software development packages and he was looking around to for some better packages to sell. And he saw my compiler and he decided to uh, buy out Roy Sherrill's interest in it from Datalight and it was uh, rebranded as Zorlin C. Mm. And of course, Philippe Kahn of uh, Borland fame uh, discovered this and was ex wrote us an extremely angry letter saying, if you call it Zorlin C, we're going to sue you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a copy of that letter. It was quite the graphic about what he was going to do to us. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I knew it was a mistake calling it Zorlin, but John wanted to call it Zorlin. But I said, you know, we're just going to have to change the name. So we wrote a letter, an apologetic letter to Philippe and says, okay, okay, we'll change it to Zortec. And, mm. you know, we didn't mean to uh, do this to you. And he was a real nice fellow. And so he agreed. And so it became Zortec C++. And it was the first uh, native C++ compiler anywhere. If you exclude the beta version of uh, G++, which was 
had come out a couple of months earlier. Mm -hmm. And also the G++ wasn't on DOS. Mm -hmm. So the fun thing about being it on DOS is although AT&T Seafront was available on DOS, uh, Seafront was a translator which would translate C++ to C. And then the output was then compiled by the Microsoft C compiler, which was a rather slow C compiler. And the end result, it was very slow compilation was its first problem. And its second problem was it didn't have memory models that were necessary for the 16-bit segmented architecture. So that mean that meant that Zortex C++ just owned the field and the rate of increase of messages in Objective-C and C++ just went like that. Mm. That is, C++ just took off then. Mm. And Zortec was the beneficiary of that taken off. Uh, we completely dominated the C++ scene. And then at a technical conference, um, uh, John and I were talking with Eugene Wang of Borland, and you know, John made a big mistake in uh, bragging to Eugene about how many compilers we were selling. <laughs> 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 And when I saw Eugene's face, I knew we'd made a huge mistake. <laughs> um, it wasn't long after that that Borland announced that they were working on C++, and which became Borland C++, which right. you know was a very strong competitor. And with Borland's success, and Microsoft came along and did C++, and you know Objective C was effectively buried until Apple resurrected it. Another story, funny story about Philippe. I was in his office a couple of years ago, and uh, Philippe is a very smart, very entertaining person. And I was looking at his office wall, and there was a letter on that wall. And I noticed that letter is one of the uh, spam form letters that Borland was known for sending out at the time. And it always started out with, dear friend, and then insert the uh, recipient's name. So... <laughs> You know, it was pretending to be, you know, dear friend so and so. From then the bottom, it says your friend Philippe, and uh, it was advertising Borland C plus plus. And written across this uh, letter in red lipstick, I think, because it was big fat red lines, was dear Philippe, I am not your fucking friend. <laughs> Got it, Phil, <still>, baby. <laughs> Now, what I loved about Philippe Kahn is he wasn't insulted by that at all. He was proud of it and stuck it up on the wall in his office. So <laughs> how can you not like a guy like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So the this has carried us now up through the late 80s. It was uh, 1985 that uh, you partnered up with Data Light or with, with John and Data Light. And it was... Uh, 1987 that uh, you did the DFA and Data Light Optimum C. Mm, okay. Ac according to our document, <laughs> our paper. Okay. I, I, <laughs> the, the actual years tend to get fuzzed over in my mind, which year is which. <laughs> no, I understand that. It happens to me too. And then it was in uh, early 88 when Zorland uh, came into the picture. And that was, uh, it was in 88 that you released uh, Zortec C++ toward, toward late 88 in October. So uh, th the compiler continued under the Zortec brand um, until Symantec came along. And that uh, apparently was in June of 1991 that they purchased, acquired uh, Zortec. Uh, That's right. How did that come about? Well, uh, Symantec was looking for a C++ compiler, and we were doing very well. And so they came and asked us if we wanted to sell the company to them. And John and I thought about it, and the compiler is doing well. We liked working for ourselves. We were making a lot of money every month. <laughs> but we didn't want to say no to Symantec. So we decided, let's name a ridiculous price, and uh, <laughs> they'll go away. Well, we named a ridiculous price, and they said, okay, and they bought it. <laughs> <laughs> go big or so go the, home. The, less, <laughs> the, the lesson there is never underestimate um, the value you have. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow, so that was, uh, that was really good for you guys then. 
It was good. Yeah. So they, they continued to market it as Zortex C++ for a little while and then uh, released it as the rebranded Semantic C++. And you continue to be the uh, primary developer and maintainer of the Windows version. What other versions, uh, what other platforms are they supporting? Um, at Zortec, we supported DOS and real mode, DOS and 286 DOS extenders, 386 DOS extenders, and Windows. Mm. And I don't know just when we supported a Windows NT, the 32-bit Windows. But yeah, we did in that too, and also OS2. Okay. Uh, Semantic cut that back. Wanted to mainly focus on the Windows 32-bit. It was also at this time that Optlink came into the picture. Yes. Uh, we had a big problem in the 80s. Um, Microsoft shipped a linker with every copy of DOS. So everybody had a copy of the linker. You know, Zortex C++ relied on that linker. And the problem was, was there were so many different versions of Microsoft linker. And some of them worked with our product and some didn't. So I had slowly created a rather large collection of Microsoft linker versions. I had my linker disks, which were just chock full of various versions of the linker. So I could sort of create a list of which ones worked and which ones didn't work. Uh, the problem was even when they didn't work, there was nothing I could do about it because I couldn't just ship them a Microsoft linker that worked. Mm. It reached a point where this was becoming a disaster for us. So a friend of mine, uh, Bjorn Freeman Benson, decided he could write a, a linker for us called Link. And he did, and it was a very uh, workable linker and it solved our problem. Well, Steve Russell of Uplink fame, he uh, had made a business whose sole purpose was writing a clone of Microsoft linker that was like enormously faster than it. So everyone who bought Microsoft's language products wound up buying a copy of his linker and he sold site licenses to businesses and everything. And just Steve knew assembler code inside out. He was an expert at making fast code and nobody else could touch him with speed. Mm. So semantic, uh, wanted to be competitive in the linker business too, to not leave any, uh, any opportunities for, uh, for Microsoft. And so they bought Oplink too, and that became the linker for semantic C plus plus. And an amusing story about that. At one point, Microsoft, in an attempt to speed up their linker, decided to create an incremental linker. So instead of a doing a full link, if you just change one file, it would just uh, somehow try to patch the new object file into the executable. And sometimes it worked, and sometimes it created a crashing executable. <laughs> but we had this big meeting at Semantic, oh, how are we going to counter this? And uh, Steve Russell pointed out that Oplink was not only faster than their full link, it was faster than their incremental link. Mm. So there was still no purpose to, uh, there was no reason to build a, an incremental op link because it was so much faster than the incremental linkers out there. There was just no point to it. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a nice, nice thing that happened. <laughs> I, I think people today uh, who use the, you know, the, for a long time, they complained about op link on, on Windows, uh, but I mean, it has, it, it was, you know, the head of the pack uh, in its time. Yeah. Are you, are you sad to see it go? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a masterpiece of assembly and coding. And so I am sad to see it go. Uh, what killed it was programs have gotten much, 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 much larger than they were when Oplink was around and the size of modern programs cause it to come apart. Uh, mm. Doing things like uh, overflowing counts, uh, buffer size is not big enough. Uh, and the thing all being in heavily, heavily optimized assembly language made it extremely difficult to modify it. Mm. Especially like if you wanted to, if you needed to increase the size of a counter because of the larger sizes, where are all the dependencies on that counter size in there? It was just, very difficult to find. Another serious problem was there was no test suite for it. Mm. So mm. it's really hard to fix a program without a test suite because then you don't know if you broke it. So it was with a, a pretty heavy heart, I realized that it was, uh, Oplink was a dead end. Mm. And that was, that was hard to accept because it's such a nice program. 
Well, I, Oplink is an OMF uh, uh, linker, uh, the uh, OMF yes. object file format. Was that the predominant format uh, in the 80s and the 90s on, on DOS and Windows? or Yes, on DOS. On the 80s, it was the dominant format. Um, it was the dominant format for DOS. When Windows came around, it sort of started uh, going away as... Uh, the problem with OMF is it's designed for embedded systems. And once your programs exceed a certain size, again, it has problems as well with the field sizes just aren't large enough. And it's also a heavily compressed format, which uh, makes it very slow mm. on uh, more modern machines. So yeah, the format was another thing that was just hopelessly obsolete and needed to go. Okay. And in 1996, Symantec released a beta version of their uh, Java compiler. They had uh, what was it, uh, Symantec Cafe, and uh, yeah, yeah, and I guess it was Visual Cafe at some point. And uh, in 1997, they asked you to re-implement their version of Java in C++. Yes, um, that was a nice project. It produced a uh, a very fast Java compiler. The Java team at Symantec, I mean, at Sun System told us, why would you do that? Why would you uh, translate the Java code into C++? And we said, you know, for speed. And they said, well, that that's not important. And we found out a while later that all their Java developers were using our C++ Java compiler <laughs> for their development work at Sun. So, you know, that was kind of a bit of a fun vindication. <laughs> And I didn't really change anything. I just translated it to C++. And just, uh, it's a lot faster. And I guess this uh, impacted later, it impacted D's object model. What Java demonstrated was you didn't need uh, multiple inheritance. What you needed was single inheritance with multiple interfaces. So uh, D's model is a uh, single inheritance with uh, multiple interfaces. So you also, before doing this, you were not so much on the garbage collection bandwagon, but implementing a Java compiler kind of changed your mind about it, yes? Well, one of my jobs and working on Semantics Java compiler was speeding up the garbage collector. So I got very familiar with how the garbage collector worked. And then later on, when I implemented a JavaScript compiler, which is also totally garbage collector based, I learned even more about garbage collectors and I got comfortable with them and thought, well, this is garbage collection is the wave of the future for programming. I turned out to be uh, half right with that. <laughs> <laughs> the programming universe seems to be divided uh, neatly in two between uh, the people who like garbage collection and the people who hate it. Sort of like when my dad lived in a small town he asked the mayor, what's your biggest problem? And the mayor said, the biggest problem is the town is evenly divided between the dog haters and the dog lovers. And there's no reconciliation possible between the two kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I've learned it's the same thing in programming. There's the garbage collected people and there's the explicit memory management people. And you know the two just don't get along. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that uh, that divide has influenced uh, D's evolution. Uh, that the uh, no GC at no GC uh, attribute yeah. is directly related to that. If if you were redoing D from scratch today, would you include garbage collection? That was a great question. I probably would lean further towards uh, automatic reference counting than mm -hmm. garbage collection. The thing about garbage collection is most garbage collected languages do all allocations with garbage collection. They don't even do stack allocation, although Java will do stack allocation in some cases under the hood, but everything is garbage collected. So it becomes worthwhile to instrument the code. So whenever a reference is made to a memory object, it updates a data structure that says it's active. And modern garbage collectors rely on that to get high performance. But if you have mixed allocations like D offers, D offers, you can do garbage collection, you can do stack allocation, you can use malloc free, you can use reference counting, you can use any scheme you come up with to do memory allocation. Putting those, uh, they're called write gates, inserted into the generated code will make it too slow. And so we wound up by being, you can use 
garbage collection or not, we wind up with an inherently slower garbage collection than the garbage collection only languages. It puts us as a dis- at a bit of a disadvantage there. And so uh, D has tended to lean more and more towards the explicit memory allocation camp. Mm. Uh, it, could, uh, it was always able to do explicit memory allocation, but uh, we've added more features like the at no GC to guarantee no garbage collection in order to uh, cater more to that group of our users. Mm. So that was the last um, compiler you imp- implemented for Semantic. The JavaScript compiler was something else that was after you left Semantic. And you left Semantic in, in 99. They got out of the compiler business. So you decided to yep. retire. Yep. <laughs> and you got that bored. <laughs> yeah, watching TV for six weeks, that was the end of that. I was going back to work. <laughs> so <laughs> I got a hold of Semantic since they had exited the C++ business and the Java compiler business. Um, I managed to get the rights to what I'd done with the C++ compiler back from Semantic. And so I was back in business as Digital Mars selling a C++ compiler again. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's when you uh, got into a contract with somebody for the JavaScript implementation, yes? Yeah. Uh, JavaScript was written for a friend of mine, Eric Ingstrom, who'd made a startup called Chromium, and they made a JavaScript compiler. And their idea was to make a JavaScript compiler that was much faster than the existing JavaScripts and then sell it to the browser makers. Well, I wrote a JavaScript compiler and it was something like 20 times faster than any of the JavaScript compilers out there. So we thought, oh, this will be an easy sell. And we couldn't sell it to anybody. Mm. Uh, Sun wound up uh, selling it. I don't know eventually what happened to it at Sun. But it was interesting. All these uh, browser makers wanted to do their own JavaScript compiler, and we benchmark ours for him, and it would just blow everybody else away. And they didn't want it, which I found rather discouraging and baffling. But it followed a typical pattern in uh, the things I did professionally. Whenever I wrote something that I thought somebody else would like, it was a failure. Whenever I've written something that everybody told me I wasn't qualified to do it. I wasn't good enough to do it. Nobody wanted this product I was thinking of making. It was ridiculous. It's turned into a major success. (laughs) (laughs) The JavaScript compiler fit that pattern. The Java native compiler also failed because it turns out people didn't want it. Mm. They wanted the uh, Java Java compiler, Mm. even though it was much faster. So one of the things with D, when I came up with the ID, the, the idea, the, <laughs> I shopped it around all my friends. They all thought it was crazy. Nobody would want this. They'd laugh. It was called the Mars programming language, but they all kind of derisively called it D. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so this is new to me. I, I knew that your friends had referred to it as D, but I, I didn't realize it was in derision. It so. was in derision, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, your D compiler, yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that. That's what I got from them. <laughs> so, so this is another thumb in the eye thing. You're, oh yeah, you're, you're gonna, you're oh, gonna yeah, jokingly yeah, call it D. It's D. It's D. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. The story of my professional life. Is, I'm gonna get you guys. <laughs> I mean, they were nice about it. They were my friends, but you know, all I can say is. You know, if any of you out there are considering writing your own product, uh, you know, have some faith in yourself and ignore everyone who tells you you can't do it. (laughs) The only person who had faith in me was uh, my dad, and that's because he had no idea what I was doing. (laughs) (laughs) That's just the way it goes. Um, You know, once I got it running, I started, you know, sending copies around to my friends and they would offer suggestions to it. And one of them, unbeknownst to me, submitted it to Slashdot. And mm. that was its first public appearance. And all of a sudden, you know, the Jan Nepper, who was uh, doing all the hosting services for us, said his poor server was melting down with the, <laughs> the Slashdot effect and downloading the compiler. And it just uh, grew rapidly from there. That was when the initial a boatload of users showed up mm. and you know i'm a very poor manager don't know anything about organizing it and fortunately the people who signed up were all self-starters and mm-hmm. didn't need management they just uh, 
just did it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned Yan, and uh, he, you met him earlier, prior to Digital Mars. I guess when you were still a semantic, when you were doing the uh, support uh, yourself for the C++ compiler through uh, news groups and emails. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Why, why were you uh, acting as uh, support staff? Every other compiler vendor, the support staff is separate from the developers, and the the companies actually shielded the compiler developers and uh, don't tell them uh, or don't tell anybody who they are. And me, I was always out there, you know, by my choice on the front lines doing the support because I wanted to know how people were using it and I wanted to solve their problems. And there's a, a story about that. You know, one day, uh, John Haggins of Zortec decided he was going to have a uh, meet Walter Bright press event where all the uh, press, this was in England, was invited to come by and uh, see the guy who wrote the C compiler or the C++ compiler. So I flew out to England for that. <laughs> and John had used a photo of me on the advertisements and on the manual. And when I met the uh, reporters and the journalists, they thought, I was an actor hired to be the front man for the compiler, sort of like, you know, Mr. Goodwrench or, you know, the Michelin man or, or something like that, uh, or Betty Crocker, <laughs> and that I was a model. And of course, I was uh, very flattered at my very brief uh, <laughs> modeling career. They also thought that Walter Bright was a made up name, you know, because, you know, it sounds ridiculous that a Walter Bright would be the actual guy who would write a C++ compiler. So they demanded to see my passport. So I always carried my passport in a foreign country because I'm always terrified of losing it. So I opened it up and sure enough, you know, it had my name on it. So they said, okay, but you're not really a C++ compiler writer, are you? And I said, yeah. So they started asking me all these uh, technical questions about compilers and <laughs> after I I finished, they sort of grudgingly admitted, oh, he really did write the compiler. <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of shows you that the, you know, the extent of the distance that companies would put between the compiler writers and the public. Right, right. Um, they didn't, they didn't believe it. <laughs> so this, uh, uh, Yan, uh, I don't know if he was the, the, if we could call him the first uh, contributor, but he is the basically the longest contributor to the uh, the longest term contributor to the D ecosystem. He, he yes. started hosting, he, he offered to host uh, the digitalmars.com website, your news groups uh, uh, early on. Still does. Yeah. And he still does uh, uh, today. So that's, that's quite uh, a long, long commitment there. And that was in, in 99 when you started uh, the business, I guess, right? The late, late 99. Uh, yeah, it was towards the end of 99. Uh, uh, first, it was a JavaScript compiler, and then sort of a, in the background, I started working on the... Right, but digital... I was working on the JavaScript compiler. The company, Digital Mars, was was uh, 99. And and so then you started getting the ideas for D, and it took you about two years between the initial work you did and the uh, first alpha release uh, of yes. the compiler. How did you go about... Uh, putting the spec together at, at, at that time, putting the features set together. I, I guess you started just based on what uh, was already in your head, but uh, were you taking in, in input feedback from uh, uh, other people uh, about features and? Oh yeah, um, the language has uh, many roots. Uh, most obvious of course is my experience with C and C++ and my uh, support for users on that gave me a pretty good idea of what uh, worked and what didn't work. Mm. There was also, I read, uh, there's the Pascal influence, the basic and Fortran influence. And in uh, around 1981 or 82, I got a hold of the uh, Ada mil spec and read that. And I thought Ada was a marvelous language, but I was thoroughly intimidated by it and thought it was way too complicated to implement. But I've always kind of had a soft spot for Ada. Mm. And one of the features of D is uh, taken directly from Ada, and that's the uh, putting underscores in numeric literals so that you can, so instead of commas, which won't work, you can use underscores. And that has since caught on in all the other languages. Mm. Mm. But uh, it was originally in Ada, and D kind of popularized it. So there's that. And occasionally people would write lists of, 
how they would fix C. And those lists had floated around the uh, news groups and the internet for years. So I knew about those. And when I was working with Eric Engstrom on JavaScript, um, he had done a stint at Microsoft as a programming manager, and he would tell me all the things that worked and didn't work with mm. languages and the troubles they had. And I thought, well, you know, making this thing more management friendly is uh, is going to be a good idea too. So it was a, uh, a mix of all that stuff. Mm. Um, what I was missing though was experience with uh, non-curly brace languages. Mm. And uh, the only dynamic language I knew was JavaScript. So those kind of things and some of the more academic languages I was unfamiliar with. And uh, so I was a little behind the curve with that stuff. Mm, I see. Well, you got everything up and running, a community started to form, and uh, that set you on the road to uh, D1.0 several years, well, a few years uh, later. But that mm -hmm. is a topic for another conversation. And I hope we can have that one uh, sometime in the not too distant future. And uh, for now, though, um, looking back on the uh, experiences that led you to the early design of D uh, and the later design of D, uh, what would you say stands out the most? Uh, what was the, the most important uh, factor in your career? that impacted uh, the design of D the most? That being fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wouldn't do this if it wasn't just a lot of fun. You know, I'm a detail-oriented person. I like going into details. I like dealing with them. And for me, you know, a programming language is a, is a work of art, and it should just give you that feeling of rightness that comes off of a piece of well-written code. It it's, it's, doesn't have awkward things in it. It's it's smooth. It, you you can express what you want in a smooth, straightforward way. That uh, that gives me a lot of pleasure when we're able to do that. And another thing that's pleased me, I'm going to talk about at D conference, is uh, discoveries we've made with D, which are. When you have, combine a bunch of features, sometimes they form emergent properties. And some of those emergent properties are quite uh, delightful. So mm, mm. I'm going to be talking about some of those at DCOM. Just fun things that we discovered that make your programming uh, easier and more fun and more reliable and, and are just plain cool. Oh. And I like when you discover things. You know, all languages, you discover things in it like... Uh, C++ discovered you could do uh, iterators and algorithms. That mm. wasn't originally designed in the language. And later on, uh, uh, expression templates were kind of discovered and they were uh, popular for a while in C++. And, you know, D has its own things that have, have been discovered that are fun. So mm. I'll bend everyone's uh, ear about that at D conference. <laughs> and that's uh, DConf22 in London for people watching this in the future. And uh, at the time we're recording this, we're about uh, just a little over three weeks out uh, from the conference. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we're really looking forward to being back in person. We, we've had to cancel two years now uh, because of the pandemic. So, Walter, again, thank you for being here today. I think that brings us to the end. And uh, have a nice weekend. And I will see you, no, you too. <laughs> at DCOF. <laughs> Look, I'm totally looking forward to hefting a pint with you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the best part, right? <laughs> best part. I learned uh, that from the Zortec, the Zortec days in London. We always went to heft the pint. <laughs> <laughs> That's another tradition that's carried forward then. All right. So, yeah. all right. Yeah. Take Bye. care, Walter. Bye-bye.